Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Saul Becker, and I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor and Head of the College of Social Sciences. Um, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the University of Birmingham for the inaugural lecture of Professor Paul Burstow. Paul Burstow has over a quarter of a century of public policy experience, covering local government, health and social care. He served for two and a half years as Minister of State for Care Services in the Department of Health during the coalition government, where he had an extensive ministerial brief, including care for the elderly, adult social care, mental health, cancer, diabetes, and learning disability programs. Paul was also responsible for reforming social care law, drafting the government's mental health strategy, the return of public health to local government, and the creation of health and wellbeing boards. After 18 years, Paul left Parliament at the general election in May 2015. Outside of Parliament, Paul Burstow has chaired a number of independent commissions, one on mental health with the think tank Centre Forum, another on the future of residential care with the think tank Demos, and another with the Local Government Information Unit on home care, which reported in December 2014. More recently, Paul has led the Right Place, Right Time Commission for NHS providers, examining transfers of care. And he also undertook a review of the impact of the Care Act on carers for Carers' Trust in 2016. His passion for mental health found a new outlet when he was appointed to the chair of the world-famous Tavistock and Portman NHS Foundation Trust last year. Paul joined the University of Birmingham as Professor of Mental Health Policy in March 2016. And he's taking the lead in the university's work around mental health public policy. He's convening and leading a major public policy commission examining the evidence for prevention and for early interventions to reduce the burden of mental illness. And the work of this commission is about to launch soon. Paul is also working with colleagues from across the University of Birmingham to establish a research institute in the area of mental health, including mapping of the university's existing activities around mental health to identify gaps, areas of strength, and opportunities for cross-university work working, sharing of expertise, and to build on our existing external collaborations in this field. As a university, we are honoured and delighted to have Paul on our faculty. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Paul Burstow, who will now deliver his inaugural lecture entitled Closing the Mental Health Treatment Gap, Time for a New Paradigm. Please welcome Professor Paul Burstow. Uh, thank you very much, Saul, and um, thank you very much for that welcome, and uh, thank you all very much for coming to uh, this lecture today. Um, what I want to do is set out some arguments that are going to inform the work of the commission that you've just heard uh, the university is going to be setting up and which will be launching very soon. And uh, really, this lecture is about making a case that I believe uh, is critical to the sustainability of our health and care system in this country, but also uh, many other health and care systems around the world. And in a nutshell, it's this. Today, only one in three adults gain access uh, to mental health treatment, even though they have a diagnosable mental health condition. And just one in four children and young people in this country gain access to mental health services despite having uh, a diagnosable mental health problem. Um, there is a huge access issue and treatment gap uh, in our country, and this is a global issue as well. And my argument is that this, 
that simply expanding the existing services to recruit more psychologists, more psychiatrists, more uh, mental health services to try and close that gap on its own will not be sufficient. Indeed, it may prove unaffordable and it may be impossible to recruit the workforce needed to realise that ambitious goal. So therefore we have to think about what we can do instead to close the treatment gap and my argument is that we have to be smart, we have to head upstream, we have to address the causes of the causes of mental ill health and many of those have social determinants and I will say more about that as uh, my talk progresses. Uh, so this lecture is very much about uh, setting out a case for population health approach to mental health in this country and with an ambition through this commission to influence public policy in this country to invest in a way that has not been the case so far in interventions that would do just that. So let me say a bit about myself. Um, well, the first thing to say, um, I'm told in August you should say a bit about yourself. You heard quite a bit about it from Saul, but I think I'll repeat some of it and add to it. So I was born in 1962. That's why there's nothing after 1962 on that chart. Um, I was born at this place, uh, St Helier Hospital in Carshalton. Uh, it was built in the 1930s before the NHS and it's still standing to this day and uh, still a source of much uh, controversy in terms of whether it will or won't be there in another 30 or 40 years. Um, I was educated uh, at this uh, very small picture, it's a Glastonbury High School for uh, boys is the school that I went to in Carshalton, not in Glastonbury in Somerset, and it certainly wasn't uh, a festival that uh, uh, being educated at that particular school. I then went on to this place, which was uh, Carshalton College of Further Education. Now, I'm the product of a two-tier education system. I went to a secondary modern school, and uh, the thing that uh, turned my opportunities and opened my opportunities that mean I'm on this stage tonight was Carshalton college and the lecturers there. They opened up opportunities for me, they instilled in me an interest in learning that I am afraid previously had not been there and uh, although they're not here tonight I still really appreciate what they did for me. Uh, they set me on a path uh, which has led me to here tonight. And um, then I wound up uh, going on to South Bank uh, University it is today, but it was a polytechnic when I went there and I had uh, some very uh, interesting times there. Now as part of this period of my academic life, studying uh, at college, I started to get involved in politics a bit uh, as a volunteer, as a very young volunteer, delivering leaflets, knocking on doors, all the things that are the meat and drink of real politics. And um, I got involved at that time and that also was uh, sowing the seeds of things that uh, came later. One of the things that came later as a result of that initial political activity uh, in, my, in my 20s was an opportunity to stand for my local uh, council, London Borough of Sutton. And uh, in 1986 I was elected to be a, a councillor and I served on that council for 16 years uh, with a particular interest in environmental policy but increasingly policy affecting people with a disability and how we could uh, develop a, a more accessible council. And um, we ran that council for 30 years, but in 1995, probably the most important thing in my life, still the most important thing in my life, uh, who is here today, Mary, uh, I had the privilege of marrying Mary. And uh, that, uh, that, that was, um, is and will continue to be, uh, and I'll stop embarrassing her, but the most, uh, most important thing in my life. And then in 1997, um, I should just explain the context of this. Having been a councillor for six, nearly 16 years by this point, one of the real frustrations as a local government councillor was how much opportunity there was to do things, but how limited your ability to do those things were by the way in which central government set it, sort of the parameters in which you could operate. So how can you change the parameters? You go to Westminster, at least that's the idea. Whether that did lead to change is another matter. But I went to Westminster, at least in part, because I was frustrated by the fact that the place that should and could be able to do most couldn't because of what Westminster stopped it doing. So to go to Westminster to try and argue that case. Um, and over the time I was there, one of the first things I read as a, as a new backbench MP, as a report, that looked at the issues of the over and inappropriate use of antipsychotic medication not the most exciting, you might think, report for a backbench M MP to read back in 1997. But this report lit a, lit a flame for me. It, it sparked an interest 
which has really fueled so much of what then followed. Because that report identified something which I thought was a scandal then, and which took 10 years of research, reports uh, keep taking the medicine and so on, which highlighted that the use of this medication and the evidence base around its use in the management of challenging behaviour from people suffering from dementia was shortening lives, was reducing the quality of people's lives significantly. And it took 10 years of me and others raising these issues in Parliament, countless questions, countless debates, and eventually uh, a recognition in government policy and some attempt to bear down on the problem. Although the pressure to bear down on it seems not always to have been sustained and we still have a, a real issue there when it comes to, um, to that. And the other report I did was about uh, the, who pays for care. And uh, I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail about that, but basically it's about the dispute between whether the NHS picks up co care costs or whether the individual does. And I did quite a bit of work on that. And then uh, in 2006, as part of my parliamentary career, I became a chief whip. Now, if you've ever watched uh, The House of Cards, it's a BBC drama, it's now an American drama based around a US president who seems to be the most amazing backstabber and uh, so on, archetype politician, you might say. Um, I was a chief whip, and what this role teaches you, especially if you're in a relatively small political party, is how to manage uh, a group of cats, how to organise through, uh, not through the uh, use of authority and uh, levers of uh, control, uh, a group of, group of individuals, actually to get them to operate by consensus. Uh, and whilst I was in that role, my parliamentary group had the most unified voting record of any group in parliament. And I never had to use the whip uh, when it came to, uh, to that. So it taught me a lot about maintaining teams by building consensus. I think a skill which is very relevant to a lot of the work uh, that I hope to do here and will be doing elsewhere as well. And then, in 2010, we had a very unexpected outcome. We had a general election where no one secured an overall majority and a coalition government, the first for 60 years, maybe the last for another 60 years, we don't know yet, um, was formed. And as a consequence of that, I received a phone call uh, on my birthday, which I had never expected to uh, receive. I'd expected always to be perhaps an opposition member of parliament. Uh, and that was inviting me to become Minister of State for Care Services in the Department of Health. My dream job, probably the only job in government I really would have wanted to do, because it was the one that I had cared about and campaigned about uh, the issues that that minister had responsibility for. And you've heard of the, 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 the extraordinary range of responsibilities I had, and you had to prioritise where you, where you would focus your time. And um, that led me to really prioritise a number of things, not least mental health. And uh, I'm going to say a lot more about this in a minute, but um, one of the things that we produced was a strategy called No Health Without Mental Health. And what that introduced was a novel idea at the time. It was the idea that there should be a parity between physical and mental health in terms of policy making, in terms of resources, in terms of standards, in terms of the way we think about these things in public policy. Now, that doesn't sound terribly revolutionary. It just sounds like a statement of what should be the blindingly obvious. But if you look at the landscape, even today, parity of esteem is still a pipe dream. It's still a long way off. But it nonetheless helps set the framing of the debate and has given mental health, I think, more opportunity than it's had before. And um, I think in these uncertain times, it has helped a lot. One of the other things the strategy also helped do was fund for the first time from government resources an anti-stigma campaign called Time to Change. And again, I will say a little bit more about that in a moment. And the other uh, area that I have responsibility for at the time was social care. And we produced a white paper and, as you've heard, we redrafted care legislation. And we did two things that I think are very relevant to a debate about mental health and closing the treatment gap in that legislation. One, we said that we needed a new principle for organising social care, which was that we should organise it around the promotion of the individual's well-being, and two, that we should elevate to an e equivalency the role and status of carers. And those two things, I think, are really revolutionary in terms of the way in which our care services could, but not necessarily are, uh, operating at the moment. Um, of course, not all good things come to an end, and uh, my time at the Department of Health, two and a half years, came to an end, and I found myself back on the back benches. Um, but the passion, the interest, didn't end at that point. I wanted to carry on. So I did some work, as you've heard, with a think tank called uh, 
the Centre Forum, we looked at a whole range of issues around public mental health uh, and uh, set out a, an agenda which I want now to build on as part of the work I will be doing here with colleagues over the coming year. And we also did some work with Demos on residential care, an oft neglected part of the Department of Health's responsibilities and still an area which doesn't really have much public policy around it. And you've heard about my work with um, the local government information unit around home care, which again was identifying the, what's becoming the emerging trend of a sector that is collapsing and withdrawing from providing services because the fees that are paid by local authorities just don't enable them to pay uh, a, a fair rate. And then all good things come to an end. Most MPs don't get the opportunity to decide when they're going to retire. Um, and I was one of those. I didn't get the opportunity to decide. Uh, the electorate made the decision and in May of 2015 uh, I found myself no longer in Parliament and therefore had to think about how I could um, pursue the things I cared about and I felt really quite blessed by the opportunities I'd had in Parliament, in government over the preceding 18 years. And really what I want to do now is try and see how that experience of Westminster, of government, translates into the work of this university uh, and into the work that I do uh, as chair of the Tavistock and Portman NHS Trust, which again I found myself very privileged being appointed to the role of chairing that trust just uh, last uh, autumn. And being appointed here in March of this year was really, really a great honour and I'm really grateful for the opportunity that it uh, has opened up. So that's enough about me. You'll be pleased to know. And I want to just say a little bit about the Tamstock and Portman and what we do there, uh, because I think it's very relevant to some of the things I'm bringing here uh, in the work that I do. So the Tamstock and Portman is based in Swiss Cottage in North London. Uh, its history is, it stems from two clinics that were established in the 1920s and the 1930s. Uh, and they are based very much on the psychoanalytical, uh, systemic and psychosocial traditions of mental health and therapeutic treatments. And this institution is very much the spiritual home of, um, of mental uh, thera therapeutic interventions in the UK and around the world. And I think the best way I can sum up what it's about is that the approach it takes to mental distress uh, is grounded in an appreciation, an appreciation of the whole person. It's not just focused on treating the presenting diagnosis. It's about understanding the person in their context and the relationships that often shape the way in which they respond to the world and interact and uh, in, in, indeed impact upon their mental well-being. And we are, alongside our provision of services, we are a, uh, an education and training provider uh, of clinical psychotherapists, of social workers and so on, and we also are a service provider. We provide a, a range of child and adolescent mental health services in uh, North London and we also run a number of national services. So we run the Family Nurse Partnership, we run a thing called the uh, Family Drug and uh, Alcohol Court Service which is a problem solving court which uh, has found to have very significant impact compared to ordinary court proceedings in child and family law in terms of actually maintaining families together uh, and getting longer term benefits for the children. So that gives you a bit of a context of where I am and where I've come from and what interests me. So where do I start with this talk? Well, I've said already that my argument is this, that a sustainable healthcare system needs a new paradigm and it needs therefore to look, I think, beyond the bricks and mortar uh, of our hospitals, of our health centres, of our consulting rooms, of our A&Es. And we need to focus on the causes of wellness. Uh, and that means understanding the complex ecology of determinants that shape uh, the way in which we grow, develop and interact uh, as human beings. And we can't really, I think, hope to close this treatment gap that I've described for mental illness simply by upsizing the services that we have today. We also have to do something about downsizing the population that actually have the need for these services in the first place. And that means looking at the whole person, it means looking at the physiological, it means looking at the psychological, it means looking at the social. So let me give some context to all of this. Why, why does this matter uh, and why does uh, the NHS perhaps need to be uh, uh, giving it greater priority than it does? 
So in England, the context is perhaps set by this document. It's called the Five Year Forward View. Um, and it was published back in October 2014. And the thing about this document, which was set out by the Chief Executive of the NHS, Simon Stevens, is in a way it was a political document. It was a rallying point. It offered a, a diagnosis and a vision for the 21st century healthcare system uh, that many of us want to see. And it gained a very broad consensus across professionals, across politicians, across many in society. Uh, and in a way, it was a, it was a prospectus. It was a prospectus for a deal with the Treasury. Um, and it was intended to try and close three things, three gaps. A health and well-being gap, a quality and care gap, and a funding and efficiency gap. It had a triple aim, as they call them. Uh, and by integrating the primary and secondary health care systems, the physical and mental health care systems, and health and social care, which was very much at the heart of this ambitious document, uh, the intention was to address a funding gap. And that funding gap was talked about in 2014 as being £30 billion. Now this funding gap was only the funding gap for the NHS. Social care doesn't come into this equation, but actually has a significant impact on what the true number probably is. And um, this £30 billion is really the difference between increased demand for services, cost rising, and, uh, and funding. And um, it was really about positioning and asking the Treasury for more money. And the ask was this, it was to ask the government for an extra £8 billion. Pounds. Now, in exchange for that £8 billion, pounds, the NHS has to find £22 billion. Pounds. Now, it's not perhaps surprising that a Chancellor might bite the hand off of the person offering this deal. The deal was uh, accepted. But what we now have is eye-watering efficiency challenges, uh, perhaps greater than the NHS has ever faced and certainly ever been able to deliver. And that's set against a backdrop of really significant pressure within the system, of cr increasing deficits at least until uh, the end of the last financial year. And um, we're in a perfect storm, a really perfect storm, which actually is being contained within the NHS system and not being made as public, I think, as it really needs to be. And um, one of the things that that perfect storm includes is a huge deficit of 2.4 billion, probably bigger than that up to last year, and maybe a slightly smaller this year, but we don't know because of some accountancy tricks that maybe are going on at the moment. And the whole thing about this is that many, many organisations as a result of that in the NHS are under very serious stress uh, and pressure. And the thing that worried me most about the five year forward view was the five, the number five. It's linked to political cycles, so I can understand that entirely, but in truth you don't transform systems in five years. And most of the changes that need to be made haven't even started yet, and the time is ticking along. I sometimes feel as though this is an example of the Emperor's New Clothes. I decided not to put a picture of that up, um, but nonetheless I think that uh, is the context in which any debate about mental health uh, has to be framed. So, before I go on to develop some of the points about public mental health, why do we need to invest in mental health? What uh, is uh, the priority for this? And why do we need to start thinking about this as a whole system rather than one that divides on the basis of mind and body? I think if uh, Bevan and Beveridge were alive today and they were to come and visit the NHS and view it, they would find a great deal of comfort in that it would look very like the service they created back in the 1940s in so many ways. But they created a service that was there to try and rid people of the fear of having to pay a health bill. Today our healthcare system is confronting a whole different set of challenges. It's confronting the challenge of how we manage long-term health problems. And how we manage long-term health problems is hampered by an artificial divide between physical uh, and mental health. Now that is breaking down, but it's breaking down far too slowly. Let's put some of the context in terms of some numbers. In the UK, one in four of us will experience a mental health problem at some point in our lives. And almost all of us, as a result of that fact, will be touched in our lives by lived experience of mental ill health. And critically, I think we need to be much more open and demanding about our mental health, just as we are about our physical health. Um, 
Now, I mentioned earlier on in this talk that uh, we got some funding for Time to Change, which is an anti-stigma campaign, which has now been running since 2008. And the government, I'm pleased to say, is still funding it. And I want to just show uh, a little clip from one of the campaigns that uh, they ran, which is all about, I think, setting this challenge, but also trying to get people to think differently about mental health. I was on my sofa. It was at his house. It was after work. I was in the living room. I just made two cups of tea. Took my boots off, sat down. I told one of my oldest friends. I wasn't really sure what I was supposed to be talking about. How will I, what, what words will I use and how will I say this? Oh my goodness, what's going to be revealed here? There's this stigma attached to not only mental health, but how we approach talking about mental health. He sat and listened. I saw his honesty as a strength. I felt relieved. So relieved. <laughs> There's no grand statements or gestures. I send her a, a, a picture on Facebook and she knows then that I'm thinking of her. There are some days when I wake up and I won't feel as sparkly as I usually feel and without me even saying anything, he will bring me a cup of tea. He's just the same person. It's just normal. Whatever way you feel comfortable in whatever environment, just, just start that conversation. Go for a walk with your mate. Go for a coffee. Just the smallest thing can make the biggest difference. Small things can make a big difference when it comes to mental health. Search Time to Change online to discover the small things you can do. And I'll say a bit more about the impact that campaigns like that have actually had and the work that's been done to sort of evidence the impact and how other countries are looking at those later on. Um, the, uh, every, every few years there's a, a health survey that is published and um, last, uh, earlier this year the uh, health uh, the Health Survey for England was published. It covered the period 2014. They add additional questions from time to time, and they added some questions in this particular survey about uh, mental health. And I just want to put these two things up, as I think they, they're quite striking. One, they found 26% of all adults who had said they had received a diagnosis uh, of, a, of a mental health problem. Um, but that, in a way, is the bit that's known to the system. They then also asked and found that 18% of people said that they re would report having mental health difficulties, but they hadn't been diagnosed. They were not, if you like, within the system. The point I'm making with these two numbers and this chart is really that we have a much bigger level of need than our system really even is embracing. The gap is actually even bigger uh, than, than we sometimes uh, appreciate and is certainly well beyond what our current services could cope with and are coping with. And all of this, of course, translates in terms of economics into some really big uh, numbers. This uh, piece of work done by the Centre for Mental Health some years ago now puts a figure on the total cost and impacts of mental ill health in our country, 105 billion, 26 billion of that within the workplace uh, in terms of uh, poor mental health, particularly not just in terms of people being absent, but also presenteeism within the workplace, and it equates to about a thousand pounds per employee. But of course, we're not just talking about people in the workplace. Um, because at the same time, less than one in ten people with a mental health uh, problem who are known to services actually has a job. Even though when asked, the majority would say they would like to work, have some opportunity for purposeful activity and paid activity. Um, and 60% can, with the right support through individual placement support, get a, get a job. And indeed, I hope we'll see those sorts of models that have good evidence being rolled out uh, in this and other parts of the country soon. We also know that 80 to 90 percent of prisoners and 40 percent of people in the probation service have diagnosable mental health problems. We know that children who uh, start er have early starting behavioural health problems uh, have the poorest life chances in our society. And we know that 5 of those 5 percent of children who have the most serious behavioural problems are 20 times uh, more likely to end up in prison in their mid-twenties and cost over, the life, over their lifetime about £250,000 uh, to society. So there are big challenges, big opportunities if we begin to look at this differently. And um, we know that half of uh, all illness recorded before the age of 65 is actually mental health related. And we also know that uh, four out of 10 acute patients uh, have uh, mental health problems. And if that was not compelling enough, we're only spending 9.4% of our NHS budget on mental health. 
and I'll say a bit more about spending in a moment. In truth, we're spending a lot more on mental health, but we just mask it by spending it badly in other parts of the NHS system. What this chart, rather busy chart, shows is the significant increase in costs where there's a co-occurring mental health problem with a physical health problem. The example is around diabetes. Uh, there are a significant number of people living with diabetes in our country, and the opportunities for integrating psychological approaches alongside the physical health treatment of people with diabetes in terms of better outcomes for the individual uh, and reduced costs is, is really significant. But it has a significant uplift in cost if it's not managed well. And again, primary care can play a big part in all of this, and it's why the NHS needs to be shifting its emphasis into uh, primary care uh, as, a, as a priority. And um, this number is just worth stressing. And again, it's why a more relational approach to the way in which healthcare is delivered is so important, with so many people living with long-term health conditions. Um, health and care practitioners increasingly are having long-term relationships with their patients, not episodic relationships. And uh, that has its uh, impact in terms of costs as well. The King's Fund did a piece of work trying to estimate the cost of this poorly managed co-occurring mental health within our physical health care system. They came up with this figure. Uh, it's a few years old and it's, I think, quite a significant underestimate. And when the Mental Health Task Force that reported earlier this year came out, they came up with a figure, that's what they estimate we're spending on mental health in England at the moment, 34 billion pounds. And they broke it down and I don't expect people to be able to read all the detail on this chart as to how it was spread across government. But the really big number on that chart, and the surprising number on that chart, is this one. 14.4 billion of the money spent on mental health actually isn't spent by the NHS or government at all. It's the costs that right, fall on individual family carers, uh, which I was pleased they acknowledged, even if it doesn't then follow through fully into policy. And this one is really just a piece of work done by the Early Intervention Foundation, which just adds, I think, further weight to the cost of late interventions uh, and they've done an amazing amount of work analysing these things and I think it's just worth emphasising. So there's a powerful economic case for doing more on the treatment side of mental health as well as there being a case for doing more to get upstream as well. And there's a moral case as well. And the moral case is this, that um, there's a 20 year differential in life expectancy for those living with long-term and serious mental health problems. Work done by Public Health England that was published about a year ago really adds some depth to understanding these stolen years. Um, they found, as we know, that uh, life expectancy in this country for most of us has increased significantly. Since 1940 through to 2010, men saw their life expectancy go up by 20 years, women saw it go up by 19 years. Um, and uh, that's great. That's great, unless you have a mental health problem. And what they found was that people with common mental illnesses such as depression or anxiety, uh, around nine, which accounts for about 19% of the population, made up 32% of all the deaths. So for people living with a mental illness, today their life expectancy is the same as people who in the whole population in 1950. In other words, they're living as if they were in 1950, and then they will be living the length of life of someone in the general population in 1950. And NHS Digital, who collect all the statistics in the NHS and publish them, found that the mortality rates were 3.6 times the rate of the general population for people with mental health. So if I put that another way, starkly, every year in this country there are 40,000 avoidable deaths that have mental health as an underlying factor. And let me just explain that, because I don't want people to go away and think it's because of the mental illness. The things that kill any of us are the five big killers. Um, and I'll say a bit about what they are in a moment. But um, this chart just shows when it comes to smoking rates, uh, for example, uh, just how many years it knocks off people's lives related to the type of mental health diagnosis. It is significant. And um, smoking and tackling smoking, avoiding heart, lung, liver disease, diabetes and cancer, all of these things are the things that we have to focus on when it comes to lengthening the lives of that part of our population who are living with mental health problems suffer the most. 
And whether it be smoking as a particular priority, there's certainly more that we could do there. And for me, this again speaks to the need to look at the whole person, not to treat the parts, but to treat uh, the whole, to incorporate mind and body. And I want to just show this chart, because this sort of just demonstrates a significant variation across the country in life expectancy, inexplicable variation in life expectancy related to the level of diagnosis of mental health. A really valuable tool for trying to understand why uh, different areas seem to have different levels of success. So, I mentioned earlier on the five-year forward view. Well, then the government brought it, the uh, NHS England published a five-year forward view for mental health. And in a nutshell, uh, that sets out three key priorities. It says we need to have seven-day services to deal with crisis. It says we should integrate physical and mental health. And it says we need to focus on prevention. It also says we need to target inequalities. And the good news, last, just this year in January, Prime Minister, as it was then, announced a billion pounds extra to go into mental health by 2020, ramping up over the life of the parliament. I can tell you as the chair of an NHS trust in mental health, we struggle to find out quite where that money is. Uh, we're told it will come, we're told it will come next year. Um, next year seems always to be next year, but there is a real issue about whether that investment will become real on the ground. And um, part of that is how we achieve this path to parity. And this is a slide that uh, one of my colleagues here has used in some of her talks, and I think it really does very powerfully talk to the, the point about how we have to integrate a range of different interventions and different ways of thinking about mental health in our society. Um, and, and to think about the person at the heart of that when we're doing so, not think purely in systems terms. And I said at the beginning of this talk that I didn't think we could scale up the existing workforce. And why do I say that? Well, I say it because of some work done by the Centre for Workforce Intelligence. I think there's more work to be done around workforce and understanding the workforce projections, but this one simply says that uh, when it comes to healthcare workforce, it's growing, the demand for it is growing faster than the rate of the overall population. Now, this was work that was done before Brexit, before us beginning to understand what that might mean for workforce in the NHS and so on. But it does suggest some really significant challenge around meeting the workforce needs of the existing system, let alone trying to close a treatment gap as well. And um, I mentioned this five-year forward view. The thing that they said in the mental health one, they consulted 20,000 people with lived experience of mental health, and they asked them, where would your priority be if you were investing money in the future? And one of the things I found really heartening from this uh, uh, survey was this, that the third most important thing that uh, respondents said was invest in prevention. And these are people who already were experiencing mental ill health, but felt that that should be the priority. But that does raise a question. When you look at our healthcare system compared to many others, and uh, an organisation called the Commonwealth Fund has done just that, we do pretty well on most of the measures that are used to compare internationally sort of first world healthcare systems. We do very well. But there's one we don't do so well on, that's on healthy lives, prevention, helping people maintain their well-being, their wellness. And I think there's a, there's a reason for that, and it's fundamentally about the underinvestment over a very long period of time in, in prevention and early intervention. And um, I, I like to think about this in terms of uh, probably my misspent youth, uh, and think about how you can frame what I'm talking about. And I, I can't think of a better image than this. Um, now, if you've ever watched a TV series, and some of you are probably too young, called Baywatch, Baywatch is about people diving into the sea forever, pulling people out, giving them uh, life-saving treatment, and sending them on their way. Never really trying to find out why they're in the water in the first place, and certainly not teaching them how to swim. This is the metaphor, I think, really, that speaks to what we have to change in the way we think about public policy in healthcare. We need to have less Baywatch, and more teaching people how to swim so that they don't uh, drown in the first place. So we do have to go upstream, and this is a rather complex chart from uh, some work that uh, Sir Michael Marmot uh, has been leading on for many years around the uh, causes of the causes, the social determinants, but the focus uh, is very much on prevention, and really by addressing the socio-economic and cultural issues and creating a more mental 
health-conscious society. And this is something Richard Layard, who is a, a key proponent of uh, these things, has talked about, and I think is absolutely right, that idea that we become a more mental health-friendly society. And also that we need to take steps to equip children uh, and young people with the emotional resilience they need to resist mental illness. And um, that does mean looking at a whole range of other factors around people's human health, their well-being, rather than just factors that cause disease. Um, and reality is that there isn't a simple single bullet. If there were, policy makers like me in government hopefully would have picked them up and done something with them. But there are a number of things that we can do, and first and foremost, we need to think about how that we look at the population as a whole. And I think there's four groups that we need to be thinking about when we're doing that. There's that part of the population who have good mental health, uh, for which the task is really about how do we just sustain that? How do we help them do that? There's the part of the population who are at risk, where the focus has to be on how do we help them reduce uh, the risk uh, of, of becoming mentally ill. There's that part of the population who have symptoms and uh, where there's a need to ensure we have a really smart system for early identification uh, and uh, early help. And then there's that final part of the population who have a diagnosis, who are in services, uh, and we need to make sure that they are getting the, ma the optimal, the right help at the right time in the right way that promotes their recovery, their ability to function and be included in society and reduce the likelihood of relapse. And we could break the population down further, but that's the main sort of elements that I would emphasize. And the focus, therefore, is very much on, on, on prevention. Now, I mentioned earlier on that I launched in 2011 this strategy called No Health Without Mental Health. And, and it was developed as a cross-government strategy, and it had a couple of aims, primarily. One was to shift the focus uh, of services towards promotion of mental health, prevention of illness, and early identification. I'm not so certain that's really what's happened in practice, but that was the ambition. And also that it wanted to broaden the approach taken to tackling those wider social determinants I've just talked about. Um, alongside that, we published this document. Uh, I commissioned this piece of work for, as a minister from the London School of Economics, and it was looking at developing the economic case uh, for mental health promotion and illness prevention. And um, it came up with five things it said we needed to do uh, that really could make a difference. It said that we should have early identification. It said that we should both promote and prevent mental illness amongst ch children and adolescents. It said we should do the same uh, for adults. It said we should make sure that we focus on the social determinants. And it also said we should make sure services were actually of a good quality. And it said you could do all those things. Now that doesn't sound blindingly, bl blindingly surprising, but it also did some work to analyse what the best buys might be, where to invest and where you might get a good rate of return, uh, which is important from the point of view of arguing these things with the Treasury. And they came up with uh, this. I'm not going to run through all of it, but it does just give you, a, I think, a sort of an idea that, for example, school-based social and emotional learning programmes, rates of return very high indeed, and, and a variety of other things. Now, I'm not suggesting that this is a pick and mix of just implementing one or two things and that solves it. It's multifactorial, it requires uh, a combination of things, but I think it is uh, interesting that this particular piece of work didn't really get the traction that I thought to hope that it would do. And as a result of that, we've not really had that sort of focus that we need on the causes of wellness uh, and what might uh, support people going forward. And one of the things that I think is really important and needs to be emphasised in all this is the importance of social relationships. Um, and this chart just sort of highlights that when compared to smoking 15 cigarettes a day, complex social relationships are a more powerful determinant, more powerful risk factor in mortality than smoking. I think a very striking finding which requires more work to understand what the mechanisms are, but nonetheless speaks, I think, as a policymaker to being very focused on what we can do to support and bolster relationships in our society. So, how do we take an approach that is about the whole population? There's a piece of work that I find very interesting and I think sort of really re requires more, uh, more practical research. And this is from uh, epidemiology. And it suggests the case that uh, psychological distress uh, and the use of uh, only individual or targeted approaches to so social 
uh, psychological distress, it is really not the way to go. What it says is that those experiencing the distress or, pre the distress or preventing... Can I start that sentence again? Because I'm really realising that I'm tripping myself up. And I'm just going to say it, because I think what this is basically saying is that just taking a targeted approach on its own will not shift the overall position of a population. We have, po we have across the population, uh, a spread of symptoms that are often below a diagnosable level in terms of mental health problems. But we have a number of people in that population who get across the diagnostic threshold and are diagnosed as having a mental health problem. What this chart simply depicts is the distribution of that across a population. And it simply is saying that we have a small part of our population who are flourishing, are doing very well, do not have many symptoms at all, and a significant number who have serious mental disorder, quite a large number of people who are languishing. They have some symptoms, but they are not ones that would trigger a treatment. And then a large number of us, including myself, I hope, uh, are sitting in that sort of moderate mental health space. And what they then went on to, 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 to conclude from this is, well, if you, if you have a population, can you do something about shifting the overall level of symptoms across the population? And by doing that, have an impact on the numbers of people experiencing the more severe uh, conditions. And they uh, looked at um, some, some data. They, looked at a, they studied uh, using data representative a sample of 6,317 adults. It's part of the British Health lifestyle survey and what this study found um, was that across all different population groups the percentage of people with clinically significant disorders was directly related to the mean and um, basically what this led them to conclude was that you could conceivably start to do something at a population level that actually moved the mean and the researchers predicted that every point one point drop in the mean of symptom scores there will be a seven percent drop in prevalence of disorder. And part of the mission of my commission is to find a way of explaining this in a more simple way than I've explained it so far today. But it is really, really important in terms of its implications for public policy. But when they did this uh, study, they then did a follow-up study seven years later, which confirmed it. And I think this finding, this ability to intervene at a population level and make a difference, not just for those experiencing the most severe mental health problems, but across the board, is a prize worth pursuing uh, and is certainly one of the things that I hope we will pursue in the commission that we're doing. Half of lifelong mental health problems in our <coughs> society start in adolescence. Their first uh, symptoms are seen in uh, the teenage years. And um, I was told this fact at a constituency surgery as an MP and it was an epiphany for me. It was a life-changing moment, if you like. It led me to think we need to do more about children's mental health. It led to a programme called Children and Young People's Improved Access to Talking Therapies. Uh, and that programme is still rolling out. And it was involving young people themselves in designing what sort of services they needed to meet their mental health needs. And um, why does this matter? Well, it matters because of some work, well, not just because of some work, but actually it's illuminated by this work, by, again, by the LSE, um, which looks at where the costs land of poorly detected, poorly managed, uh, poorly supported mental illness in childhood. And the costs land disproportionately in our schools. And I think that's why we need to support schools and we need to engage schools to promote well-being and equip our educators to understand child development uh, more fully. And this report uh, highlighted some, something about where those costs landed. And what it found was that um, by far the biggest cost in terms of mental health problems being presented and challenged and dealt with, it was in our school settings. Is the money being spent well there? Is it actually delivering better results? Is it informed by psychological practice? Could it uh, be done better? I think that uh, in a complicated, multifaceted uh, and damaging to life course situation, we need to be looking quite, quite carefully at uh, what this, uh, this data tells us and how it might inform public policy. Um, now, I said we spend 9.4% on mental health of the total NHS budget. How much do you think we spend on children's mental health in this country? This is a dangerous moment because I'm almost asking for a shout-out. Uh, so it's rhetorical. Um, 
This chart just shows the run of expenditure through to 2012-13. It's gone back down to 9.4% now. Um, that's the share of adult and child mental health. So yes, we spend six pence out of every pound the NHS spends on mental health on children and young people. We wonder why we have such a big stock of issues in adulthood in terms of mental health pressures. It's because we don't invest anywhere near enough, early enough, to make a difference. And um, this piece of work, which looked at the Millennium Cohort Study, uh, has, I think, given another reason why we need to change that investment priority. And they examined the interrelationship between parents' relationship quality. In other words, how much parents related to one another uh, and the quality of uh, mother-child relationships on the way in which the child then externalised the problems and pressures and stress that they, that they were experiencing at the age of three and five. And what this piece of work found was that it suggested that both partner and mother and child relationship problems are important and related and a policy that only focused on one to the exclusion of the other really was going to be less effective at improving or preventing uh, childhood uh, distress and childhood mental health problems. And the study concluded that programmes that enhance parental relationships are likely to be beneficial for children. And um, some recent work that's been done by the Anna Freud Centre, uh, who are a mental health charity, found uh, that um, when they surveyed 11 different mental health providers and asked uh, the clinical psychotherapists and others in those services, what was the thing that was the presenting issue most often mentioned? And on this chart that is barely legible from the back of the room, I can tell you what it says. Family relationship difficulties was the thing most often said to be the reason the person was in the consulting room. Um, and I think that uh, was reinforced by some work that Childline published recently, where again, principal reason for calls to Childline was family relationship difficulties. Conflict and separation issues within families being a really significant part of that. Um, so in a way, all of that leads me to think that we have to move from a, a model that increasingly in terms of public policy talks about this, mother-child relationships, to one that is about this, albeit that child does look a bit frightened by the, uh, <laughs> not the best photo to illustrate a positive point, but nonetheless, uh, um, and the point really is this, that just addressing the child and their presenting needs, you can't remove the family from the child's mind. And you've got to hold that in the context and understand the whole, the whole family circumstance to be successful. Um, I'm going to talk about two things that uh, Tavistock and Portman does. Others probably do some of these things as well, but which I think are part of the policy agenda that could be more widely adopted to address these things. First is this. It's called I Thrive. It's a population health approach, and it's a framework uh, for children's mental health that really is about... Uh, trying to draw a clear distinction between treatment on the one hand and support on the other. And it focuses on building on the individual and their strengths and the community of support around uh, that individual wherever it's possible. And it's very much driven by the needs and choices of uh, children and young people and their families. And importantly, it offers things like couples therapy. It recognises that the children's mental health service is not just for the children. It's actually for the family as a whole. And uh, the difference between this and what we have traditionally for children's mental health in this country is that what we have at the moment is we have a tiered system. And this tiered system is built around the convenience of organisations and the way they provide services. And it often allows for a shunting of costs between one part of the system and another. Um, what I Thrive is all about doing is centering the model around how we support the individual, how we manage risk, how we enable them to cope, how we build resilience uh, in the system. It's not based around ser services. Um, now, I put this chart up partly because uh, my father-in-law is here, but also because it makes a point. This is the Tower of Babel. Uh, and the story of the Tower of Babel is basically of man's hubris and man losing the ability to speak to each, to each other but by the fact that God uh, cursed us by having different languages. So we had to speak, we could no longer speak to each other. And this was the hubris of building a, a tower that would reach the heavens. Um, the point I want to make by this slide is that we actually have a range of different professional groups that use different lexicons and language 
to express often common problems. Um, and that certainly is the case when it comes to the way in which children and adolescent mental health services are conceived. Very different language between the educationalists, uh, the health service and social care. And if we're to really focus on the needs of the individual, then we have to think about that differently as well. Um, I'm not going to talk about that slide. I'm going to move on to simply say something about primary care. Um, because primary care is where such a large part, almost half of primary care's daily workload, comes through the door uh, with mental health problems as being an underlying or driving factor. Um, and um, what uh, we've done in City and Hackney with the Tavistock and Portman is work with uh, GPs, in fact GPs asked for this service, to provide them with a consultancy service, a psychological consultancy service, which is very much about trying to, uh, to meet the, the needs of patients with medically unexplained symptoms and various other problems. Uh, and, and the patients they're dealing with, 49% of them are patients that have medically unexplained symptoms, 52% have received two or more previous treatments, 51% of patients have uh, personality disorders, 45% uh, are frequent attenders. And this is a complex mix of patients that GPs are, are managing. And they wanted some psychological input to support them in all of that. And what um, the service offers them is really uh, assessments. It offers a range of therapies, uh, both couple, family and group therapies. And it offers case management and it offers consultation to the GPs themselves. And probably the most important thing it does is it helps the GPs and the rest of the primary care team cope with the stress and the distress of working with some of the most challenging and complex patients in the population, which itself can be a cause of burnout and stress for them. And it gets some really good outcomes. It improves uh, the, uh, the, this, this is a set of survey data that was done amongst a group of patients. It was, again, a piece of work by the Centre for Mental Health. They found significant improvements amongst this group, and they also found uh, over half of all the patients through this service reported some improvement. The problem is that the GP service is a service that, where the front door is open. People can come in, well, not all the time, but uh, they certainly can access that service on demand. This service tries to run at the same pace, but again, because of staffing constraints and pressures, it's clocking up a waiting list because of the complexity it's trying to deal with. Um, we also did, had some work done on cost effectiveness, and uh, it, it does deliver significant reductions in use of other more expensive parts of our healthcare system, as well as those better outcomes from the point of view of the individual. So there are uh, cost reductions and savings to be had here. Now, I said earlier that parity of esteem was this idea that the strategy that I introduced in government was all about. Now, that's still an ill-defined term, but it is nonetheless now in law that we should have that uh, between physical and mental health. And it did lead to the 1.25 billion commitment for children's mental health in March 2015, and it did lead the then Prime Minister David Cameron to the commitment he made in January to a billion pounds. I've expressed my scepticism about whether these sums will get where they need, but uh, they are nonetheless uh, welcome signs that mental health has gone up the agenda over the last few years. And I've talked about stigma. And I think stigma is a powerful part of why we don't have the same discourse about mental health as we do about physical health, but I think that's changing too. Um, and I wanted to just show one more film which just sort of sets the reasons why we need to do more on stigma uh, and uh, is why I think Time for Change is so powerful. So I'm just going to show this film. Oh look, Dave from Accounts is back at work. He's been off for ages for some kind of mental illness. That's an awkward one. Should I say anything? I don't know how I react. All right, Dave. Good to see you back, mate. How are you feeling? How am I feeling? Hang on, I've got to take this call. Hi, yeah, got some idiot here who's just asked me how I'm feeling. How am I feeling? How am I feeling? Sorry, I've got to, I'm just off home because I'm a bit late for dinner. Okay, all right, see you later. How am I feeling? Pretty good, thanks. Yeah. Um, 
good days and bad days, but yeah, I'm glad to be back at work. Cheers for asking. No worries. How are things with you? Yeah, great, can't complain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been busy as always. Makes you laugh, hopefully makes you think, um, but also ho hopefully begins to break down some of the stigma. And Times of Change did have done some evaluations that have been published. They found, I'll just give one example, they found that uh, there had been a 6% rise in the willingness to continue a relationship with a friend with a mental health problem. Um, two million people have changed their attitudes as a result of the campaigns around Time to Change and why I think the public debate about what prioritising mental health has become a much noisier one than it had been before. So, what next? If we're serious about reducing human misery, if we're serious about tackling psychological distress, if we really want a society where people are uh, able to pursue happiness, then we have to do something about the approach we have to mental health. We can't just scale up the existing services. And that's why I'm really, really pleased and proud to be part of this university, why I'm really pleased that we have the opportunity to establish a Birmingham Policy Commission to look at the evidence, to pull it apart and put it together and then use it to set out an agenda for action at local government level, at regional level, at national level that moves us from a debate which is simply about treating the problem to one that is about tackling the causes of the problem in the first place. And that's really what this talk has been all about um, and I hope that uh, over the coming year to 18 months that's exactly where we will be able to move it. Thank you ever so much for this opportunity um, and uh, in that film just now the, uh, the gentleman was asked how he, how he was feeling. Uh, I, I have to say I probably went through all of those emotions as I prepared for this talk. Uh, I'm feeling good not just because uh, I'm coming to the end of this talk but also because I think this is an area where this university can make a significant difference not just in the confines of the institution, but well beyond it too. Really affecting public policy, affecting practice, and changing people's lives for the better. And that, as a former politician who's still interested in politics, is surely what good politics is all about. Thank you very much.